This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. This briefing is being aired live on YouTube. A reminder, to maintain audio quality, please keep your phones on mute until it's time to ask your question. If you are able to do so, please use star six to mute and unmute your phone. Joining us for today's media briefing are Governor Tony Evers, DHS Secretary-Designee Andrea Palm, Dr. Ryan Westergaard, the Chief Medical Officer with the DHS Bureau of Communicable Diseases, and Ryan Nilsestoon, Chief Legal Counsel for the Governor's Office, are here to answer questions as well. We will begin the briefing right now with remarks from Governor Tony Evers. Good afternoon, folks. Thanks for joining us today. Today, I'm happy to report that the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation received almost 31,000 applications for the We're All In Grant program and begin sending paychecks, excuse me, payments to businesses this week. These funds will be critical as they are targeted towards Wisconsin small businesses and the folks who need it the most. WEDC staff from all departments are working to verify information with individual businesses as quickly as possible and hope to have everything completed by the end of summer. If you applied for the grant program but haven't heard from WEDC yet, they will be in touch. In addition to working on the We're All In grant program, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation released a report on the economic state of the state as we continue to battle COVID-19 and lays out some priorities for future economic success. One of the top priorities outlined by WEDC is the need for high-speed broadband access for every business owner, farmer, worker, and student moving forward. Overnight, as Wisconsin schools shifted to virtual learning and a large number of people began working remotely, we changed how we live, work, and learn in order to adapt to this virus, which has highlighted the digital divide in our state. Now more than ever, a, a strong state's economy is closely linked to access to high-speed broadband for our schools, businesses, and homes. That's why I'm proud that, we're in our, that in our last budget, we were able to make the largest state investment in broadband to expand our broadband expansion pro grant program to reach more underserved areas of our state. And today we announced the, governor, the governor's task force on broadband access, which will be tasked with going beyond funding and finding innovative, creative solutions to the broadband disparities in our state. This group is comprised of industry leaders and various stakeholders from across the state. And I look forward to their good work this summer and this fall because broadband access is not a luxury but a necessity, especially as we continue to navigate learning and working through COVID-19. At the end of the day, what the WEDC report shows and what we knew already is that there isn't an industry or region that doesn't have challenges ahead. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every corner of our state, every household and every industry and the people of Wisconsin deserve a productive effort from local and state and federal leaders. One way, or, one way we're doing this is with our Roots to Recovery program, which invested $200 million of CARES funding to reimburse local governments for the expenses incurred to address their COVID-19 recovery needs. The first round of expense reports are due tomorrow and reimbursement payments will shortly follow so our local government partners on the front lines can continue supporting their communities 
and promoting local economic recovery. Wisconsinites are resilient, and I know that if we can continue to put the health and strength of our communities first, we can bounce back together. And this challenge belongs to all of us. The economic recovery of our state depends on our public health efforts. Every day, our administration, the Department of Health Services, and the Wisconsin National Guard are working tirelessly to contain the spread of COVID-19. We have conducted more than 650,000 tests across our state. And unfortunately, over the past couple of weeks, we have seen positive cases of the virus increase at an accelerated rate that cannot be explained solely by our increasing text testing ability with some of our record, uh, record daily increases in the last week. We need to get back to, get to, we need to, get back to working together to flatten the curve so our healthcare systems don't become overwhelmed as we have seen in states across the nation where, where doctors are making difficult life and death decisions for their patients. The situation is still serious, folks. Fall is right around the corner, and believe me, I am, as, I am as worried as you are about what school is going to look like for our kids and educators, whether or not we're going to get to watch the Badgers play and how seasonal businesses will operate safely. But the good news is that we have the opportunity now to set the stage for later. As I said last week, it's all on us together to take responsibility for our role in reducing the spread of COVID-19. And we need everyone to continue doing their part by staying safer at home whenever possible, practicing social distancing, and wearing a face mask whenever they go out in public. Without a vaccine in sight, these are the best tools we have at this time to not only save lives and prevent hospitalizations, but to ensure our schools, our workplaces, and our local businesses and our communities can stay open. I know some will try to make wearing a mask a political issue, but it's a public health issue and it's certainly an economic issue. So wear a mask, not only to protect your own health, but also the health of our frontline healthcare workers, small business owners, essential workers, first responders, and many more of our, our neighbors doing the critical work to keep our communities up and running safely. And now I'll hand it over to Secretary-Designee Andrea Palm for her COVID-19 update. Secretary-Designee, it's all yours. Thanks, Governor. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us again today. And uh, today I will start out uh, with our numbers. Uh, the death toll here in Wisconsin has reached 826. There are now three, excuse me, there are now 37,906 confirmed cases of COVID-19, which is an increase of 964 over yesterday. In the past week, we have increased our cases by 5,350 and broken our previous record for positive cases four times, including today. These numbers are not the result of more testing. In fact, on Saturday, we saw, we saw more positive cases than we saw on Thursday, even though we tested half as many people. Our percent positive remains high, and these numbers are the result of significant community spread here in Wisconsin. So what does that mean? It means we need to double down on protecting our families and our communities. I mean, staying home and limiting our trips to the essentials. Wash your hands frequently, practice physical distancing, and wear a mask if you can do so safely. Another way to protect your community is to get tested. If you have any symptoms, even mild ones, or if you don't have symptoms, but you know that you've been exposed to COVID-19, please access a test call your healthcare provider, or go to one of our community testing sites. We know Wisconsin has community spread. We know that people with mild symptoms and people who have been exposed and are positive but asymptomatic can and do spread the virus. In fact, we know that people who are mildly sick or asymptomatic are more likely to spread the virus in the community than people who are severely ill because those folks are less likely to be interacting with large numbers of people. 
And that is why minimizing your interactions with others and getting tested if you need to is so important. Wisconsin summers are beautiful. Businesses are opening up. Taking all of these precautions is draining, and it's easy to get discouraged and tired. It's easy to let your attention slide, to accept the invitation to that barbecue, or to gather some friends for a drink. But again, this is what we know. We know that gatherings as simple as barbecues and bars can and have spread COVID-19. And we know that the virus goes beyond those first few people who are infected. An infection at a barbecue can quickly spread from the, those attendees to their daycare provider or to a coworker or other relatives. And the biggest danger is that one of those people is vulnerable to severe illness or death from COVID-19. That is what community spread means. And it can quickly become difficult to trace and box in. It makes it much more difficult for local public health departments to stop the spread. It means that you are at risk, but together we can choose to reduce our risk, to take precautions and help keep our communities safe, including our essential workers and our healthcare professionals. These are our choices. And we see our cases climb here in Wisconsin. Now is the time. We need to work together again to flatten the curve and stop the spread. Thank you. We will now open this up to questions. A reminder to maintain audio quality, keep your phones on mute until it's time to ask your questions. In the interest of time, please only one question per reporter. And we will begin with Scott Bauer from the Associated Press. Scott? Hi, thanks again for doing this call. I had a question about the number of tests that have been given in recent weeks. Um, the Badger Bounce Back Plan set a goal of 85,000 a week, and over the past 14 days, not counting the numbers you just reported, um, it looks like we had 70,000 last week and 61,000 the week before, um, nowhere close really to that 85,000. What, what effect is that having? Why are we not hitting that number, and what's being done to try to get up to that goal? Mm -hmm. No, thanks, Scott. That's a super important question. I think there are a couple of things going on here. One, we certainly have seen increased demand as we have seen a surge in the state. Uh, and our community testing sites that the National Guard are uh, staffing for us are busy. They're very busy. Um, uh, and so it continues to be our goal to meet, to meet the 85,000 a week. It continues to be our goal to build beyond 85,000 in anticipation of the fall. But I think uh, the other thing that people need to remember and understand in context here is that our capacity, our lab capacity, is actually uh, about 170,000 tests a week. We, within the state of Wisconsin, if, if uh, we ran 170,000 tests, we would have labs to process those tests. And so while we continue to encourage people who have mild symptoms or who have been in contact, close contact with a positive t uh, case to get tested, uh, we have continued to build the capacity across the state uh, so that we can continue to encourage people who need to get tested to get tested and that we can continue to have the capacity in our labs across the state to run those tests. All right, and now we'll go to Molly Beck at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Hi, Patrick Marley. I'm filling in for Molly. She was unable to join us today. Thanks for having us, Paul. Governor, I wanted to ask you about schools. Do you want to have in-person school this fall, or will you order schools closed uh, as you did in the spring? And if you haven't made up your mind, when will you make that decision, given that schools are to open in about a month? Yeah, and I anticipate that schools will open uh, with, you know, by early September. And, um, and that leads me to something else that just has to be said. You know, clearly the surge and the, the, the numbers are increasing. And if we do want schools open safely, we need to all get behind. I know not everybody has a kid in school, but you also know how important schools are to our future and, uh, and, the, and the quality of life in this state. So whether you have your own children or not, you, I'm really encouraging you to take it easy, be as safe as possible, wear a mask, don't get into small rooms with a whole bunch of people that don't have masks. And, uh, and help us make sure that schools open safely. The schools did receive information from the Department of Public Instruction, which, which coordinated not only with the Department of Health Services, but with group education groups all across the state. 
laid out several different options for people that are um, uh, that that uh, pe people locally can use to make the decisions. It's going to look different in different parts of the state, and uh, we're already seeing it. Milwaukee Public Schools is looking to start the year virtually and then morph into um, and morph, morph into a more regular situation, but. Um, uh, I believe that we can open schools, and so I am not in any position to say we're, we're going to or we're not going to, and I'm going to order them closed. Uh, that gets at an issue about what orders I, I can do or not do, but uh, uh, I'm still optimistic um, that they can open, and there's lots of options. But if people want, if people really want those schools to be open, they need, we all need to pay attention to it and pay attention to our own health. And then I think it, it'll be much easier for them to open safely. All right, our next question will come from WKOW TV in Madison, Danny Maxwell. Hi, um, I just wanted to follow up with the testing capacity, but specifically we got word today from a lab that does testing nationally, but also locally here in Wisconsin, that they were seeing the demand so high that their turnaround time for results is going up and up. In fact, they say for non-priority tests that the results may take seven days. So I'm wondering what the reason for this high turnaround time is for some of those labs, and do the results even matter after seven days or more? They kind of moot after a certain time period. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and, and we obviously, it's part of why um, testing has been a priority for us, and within that priority, Right, um, diversifying the technologies that we're using in testing um, so that uh, if you have a supply chain issue with one technology, one particular kind of reagent or one particular other kind of supply, that we, we have diversified the kind of technologies we're using here across the state to minimize those kind of impacts. I think we still absolutely uh, uh, have a, a, a vulnerable supply chain when it comes to testing and we, we uh, continue to track that closely. Um, but it is also why we have really tried to build capacity within the state of Wisconsin, because I think what you, uh, what what we know uh, is that um, uh, the majority of our tests are uh, uh, are resulting uh, in under two days, and that some of the labs that uh, different um, systems or different folks are partnering with that are out of state are um, having a, a real crush of, of demand, like you suggest in your question, and that demand really is driving their turnaround times, seven days, 10 days, um, uh, and into time frames that do make it less meaningful, uh, because right, the goal is to have uh, good turnaround times so that you can get to that contact tracing piece of this really quickly, because it is chasing those contacts, um, making sure they understand how to safely isolate, quarantine, um, uh, get tested, do the things they need to do to help stop the spread that is, you know, part of right how we box in this virus. And so that whole continuum of priorities are things we have been focused on, we will continue to be focused on. But I do think um, it is part of why we continue to want to expand our capacity here in the state of Wisconsin, because we want to make sure that with in the four walls of the state, we can continue to maintain turnaround times that allow us to do this work well. And as your question suggests, the higher the demand, the more um, uh, taxing that is for labs, and that can potentially impact turnaround time. So we're focused on that. We do want to continue to build our capacity within the state so that we can do everything we can to keep them as low as possible. Um, but I do think from that perspective, if folks are not getting uh, results timely, I would encourage them to call. Sometimes there are anomalies in the test or, um, you know, there were human, human error in the entering of the data. Maybe your phone number got transposed. We've had trouble reaching you. So if you, if you are somebody who is seeing test results beyond five days, I would encourage you to call um, just to make sure that uh, something hasn't slipped through the cracks. Um, but I also would encourage folks on the front end, ask if your test is being shipped out of state. Um, and uh, then you can make an informed decision about how urgent uh, and whether you need to think about um, seeking a test that will be processed within the state of Wisconsin. All right, our next question goes to Katie Anderson from WBAY in Green Bay. Katie? Katie Anderson? All right, let's move on. Sean Kirkby at Wisconsin Health News. Sean, are you there? 
Hi, um, thank you for uh, holding this. Um, I was wondering, can you provide any update on where the state is on hiring more contact tracers and whether or not that's meeting the demand is with the uh, current surge? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, John. We, um, I think I might have mentioned this uh, in our last briefing, but it's, it's hard for me to remember, so I'll say it again if I didn't say it already. Um, we are in the process of hiring uh, an additional 30 contact tracers at the state um, as, as uh, LTEs. Um, we did see, um, understandably, a little bit of attrition, and so we were looking to uh, get back up to our uh, 200 number um, that we uh, that was our target initially to make sure we were able to provide the kind of support to counties and local public health as they um, were seeing surges or seeing upticks and needed us to wrap around and provide that support to them. Uh, we are um, uh, receiving requests uh, daily uh, for assistance with contact tracing, which which we are uh, continuing to provide, um, and uh, through our uh, pretty regular contacts with local public health. Um, uh, understand um, them to be handling their um, their surges or their upticks or their caseloads, their need, uh, and if not, are, are asking us uh, for assistance. So we'll continue, obviously, to monitor that, uh, and we'll uh, pull more people in as we need to uh, um, off our LTE uh, hiring list uh, and continue to supplement uh, uh, what is happening at the local level. We also did... Um, through the CARES Act, provide money uh, to, to locals um, to bulk up their own contact tracing uh, teams. And so they are also doing that work, uh, again, to make sure that they're able to flex and uh, do the contact tracing they need to at the local level. All right. And our next question comes from Bruce Marcus at W. Sorry. R Excuse me. This is Katie. Ann All right. Uh, Katie, why don't you go ahead? Hi, sorry, thank you for taking my question. Um, I am curious, are all hospitals and labs able to do antibody testing? And if so, what's being done to encourage people to get an antibody test since those who are asymptomatic uh, seem to be um, an issue? And you, as you said, those who are asymptomatic are more likely to spread the virus. Yeah, so I'm going to let Dr. Westergaard dig into the science here, but I think that it's important uh, to understand that um, whether you are symptomatic or asymptomatic, uh, uh, you should be receiving a diagnostic test. An, uh, an antibody test is not the test we're recommending to determine whether or not you have COVID-19, but we are doing some work in the antibody space that I, I'll let Dr. Westergaard dig into. Yeah, that's right. The, our efforts around using antibody tests are... Uh, really on the research and epidemiology or the surveillance side. So there's a, there's a reason, there's a, uh, there's good reason to know on a population level, how widespread has the, has the epidemic become? So we at the state are, um, are systematically screening people throughout the state uh, through a, uh, several different projects to understand how many people have antibodies as a ref, as something that reflects past infection. But I think the point that, um, that Secretary Palm made is the important one, is that antibody tests don't tell someone if they're infected now. They don't tell us whether they're infectious or contagious. Um, and the other thing is it doesn't tell us whether people are immune or protected from future infection. So really those tests are a useful marker of being infected in the past, which can tell us some useful things, but they're not in the same category as the diagnostic tests, which are the ones that tell us whether someone's infected right now. All right, and now we will head to Bruce Marcus with WRJO in Eagle River. Bruce? All right, we'll try to get back to him later. Let's move on to Aaron Mabin from WITI Fox 6. Aaron, are you there? Hi there. Yes, I'm here right now. You know, there's a lot more mask wearing in our area with these mandates happening, and a lot of people have questions. So I, I wanna know, what is the number one thing you want people in our area to know when it comes to mask wearing 101, cleaning of the mask, when to get rid of it, rid, get rid of it all of that stuff? Yeah, I'll, I'll let the doctor run the- Sure, it's a great, it's a great question. You know, and 
as we've learned more, we've learned a lot more things about this pandemic as we've gone in the past six months in a, full, in a large range of areas of science. But in terms of infection prevention, we've learned, what we've learned about the, the ways in which face masks, both the medical grade PPE masks that we wear in healthcare settings, and also cloth face coverings in the general public, we've, they've really be, they've emerged as one of the most important tools. So we encourage, we support um, everyone to take masks, mask wearing as, a, as an important strategy on an individual level, communities, organizations, businesses, universities who want to have mandates for people to make it a sort of the normal behavior among people in their facilities and their organizations. It's a very important strategy. So in terms of the individual behavior, what is it, you know, wearing a clean mask every day is, is important. Um, medical grade masks do, you know, generally in healthcare, we require some training on how to put them on and off. So if you, someone is an employee at a long-term care facility or a, or a hospital or a clinic, they should get proper training on how to put on the different kinds of masks. In general, though, for the general public, the cloth face coverings, as long as they're clean and they cover both the nose and their mouth, um, and you wear them, particularly any time that you're within close contact with someone, it should, do, it should have a good effect. The most important thing is keeping the respiratory droplets and secretions you know, from getting out into the environment. So a, a clean mask, even if it's, if it's cloth and homemade, can have a big impact on that. So I would just say yeah, uh, consistency in wearing a clean mask um, and try to avoid touching it and re realizing that when people touch their masks, that can also contaminate their hands. So it's not, a, a, it's not a, by itself the strategy, the, the most important strategy, but as a combination of hand hygiene and physical distancing, really tremendously important. So thanks for the question. It's, it's something that we encourage everyone to do. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Rachel Glosh at TMJ4 in Milwaukee. Rachel? Hi there. Do you believe Wisconsin is at risk of experiencing a large spike in cases similar to Florida, Texas, Arizona, California? What needs to be done right now to prevent that from happening? Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. I think that's sort of the, the window of opportunity we have right now, right? Uh, whether it was in March and April or now, um, we, we've been lucky in Wisconsin not to be on the leading edge and we've had an opportunity to look around the country, whether it was Seattle and New York in the March-April timeframe or whether now, as you suggest in your question, Arizona, Texas, Florida, other places that are seeing um, spikes and surges that are really taxing their healthcare systems um, uh, to the point that they are having trouble uh, effectively treating everybody who needs hospitalization. And so I do think that people should take very seriously the cautions of, of um, and the learnings that we're getting from these other states. Now really is the time uh, because of the way um, the virus operates and, and the lag in time of infection to, to symptom onset to potential need for hospitalization and severe illness, right? There is a time lag. And so if we wait until we are in that situation, we will have waited too long. And so now really is the time uh, to double down on our work together. We did such a good job in the spring of flattening the curve and protecting each other, protecting our vulnerable citizens, protecting our frontline healthcare workers. And it really is time to do that again so that we don't uh, have to learn firsthand the lessons that Florida and Texas and Arizona and New York and, and Seattle did before them. Uh, and so I would encourage everybody to take seriously um, social distancing, physical distancing, wearing a mask, uh, the good hand hygiene, limiting your interactions with other people, um, returning to a, a regimen where you are really focused on your essential uh, errands once a week. Um, so really thinking hard about how do I reduce my risk and making decisions that do in fact reduce your risk and risk to others around you. All right, our next question, Amy Reed from News 3 in Madison. Amy? Hi, Governor Evers. Are you going to use CARES Act money to help people who are still waiting for unemployment benefits? Thank you. Yeah. I, I saw that proposal, and uh, um, we're we're looking at it. Frankly, just an in initial response is that 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 was that was um, uh, suggested by the um, Republicans. I I view it as somewhat of a political stunt. I I don't quite know how we're going to do it any faster using CARE Act. It's not as if we have 
a list of 300,000 people, suddenly we're going to say, okay, here's, we'll make a guess whether you're actually eligible. We'll, we'll send out a bunch of money. First of all, it takes human beings and an organization in order to, to physically do that. And second of all, it is uh, uh, risky just to send money out with uh, uh, no, no understanding of the adjudication process that uh, uh, D, uh, D, D, DWD does. Yes, we, we, we are going to continue to work hard to make sure that uh, uh, everybody gets the, uh, the unemployment insurance checks that they should get. We're making progress on that, and uh, I'm looking forward to the day that uh, everybody that deserves to get one should get one. All right, our next question comes from Stephanie Hoff at WIS Politics. Stephanie? Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question is for Governor Evers, and it's regarding that $10 million that the Democratic Party raised in the second quarter. What did you do personally to help pull in that money? Made a lot of phone calls at night. <laughs> Uh, raising money isn't exactly easy, and uh, I did spend a lot of time doing it. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, it is uh, important work to do in in order for us uh, to have a government that uh, has, seeks bipartisan solutions to thorny problems that that has been lacking uh, since I become governor. Uh, Republicans are. Um, not interested in cooperating on a whole number of issues. And so, yes, I did spend a, uh, a lot of time. It's really important work. Uh, I think if we want to have fair maps in the state, if we want to uh, accomplish a lot of the things that the people of Wisconsin uh, have, have asked us to do, we need to make sure that our, our government works well. And I believe that one of those ways is to uh, make sure that I still have a veto after next November, but also uh, have uh, uh, some success at the polls, too. All right, the next question belongs to Savannah Tomei from Spectrum News. Savannah, are you with us? Savannah Tomei? All right, let's move on to Eric Gunn from the Wisconsin Examiner. Eric? Thank you for taking my question. I want to alert that the moderator's uh, voice keeps breaking up in the call. Uh, that may be not something you can do anything about, but I wanted to alert you of that. My question is probably primarily for Dr. Westergaard. Um, in addition to people who simply recover from COVID-19 or people who die as a result, what kind of uh, details and data are emerging for you in the state about post-COVID recovery problems, maybe even long-term problems, such as you know, permanent heart damage, lung damage, uh, strokes, neurological damage, and that leading to either uh, weakness and loss of coordination or loss of cognitive function. Have you developed any kind of data in terms of what numbers of people may be experiencing those kinds of after effects? Sure, yeah, thanks for that question. The, there have been some peculiar things that we've learned that can correspond with the, the, the syndrome of COVID-19 that, that are somewhat atypical compared to other respiratory viruses. Um, the two big categories that those fall into are immune system phenomenon, like uh, there's a condition called vasculitis where people can get unusual uh, rashes or blood clots and blood clotting disorders. So this has been described as a number of recent publications that, that show how in addition to causing direct, direct damage to the lungs and the airways, this virus can stimulate the immune system to do damage to the body in some, in some rather unusual ways. I would say it's too early to have long-term data on how much long-term morbidity or long-term consequences related to those things are. They're definitely a minority of the cases have these unusual things. The other thing in, in children, of course, we've talked about is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. There've been a, a number of cases of these. 
These tend to be rare conditions, um, and the majority of people with COVID-19 have a full recovery. I think the, the proportion, estimating the proportion who don't fully recover, who have some lingering disability from this is gonna um, probably take some time to understand, but it's, it's definitely a small minority. Most people get all the way better. All right, our next question from Abigail Hantke, NBC 26 in Green Bay. Abigail. Hi, my question is for Secretary Designee Palm. Now, last week we were talking about uh, about more than 24, per, I think it was 24 percent of new cases were coming from gatherings like bars. Now, my question is, where are the other 80 percent coming from? So in other words, are there any trends you can talk about to kind of help people understand how it's currently spreading if 80 percent is outside of that gathering category? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that is a great question. And I, um, off the top of my head, I will tell you, I... Uh, would need a little help from Dr. Westergaard if he's prepared. Sure. Well, I'd say a, a, a big category still at the time that we purport that data are missing. So we have incomplete data related to all of all of these exposures. But I would say that the, the, it, without um, specific proportions, the other large categories are household contact. So people that live in close contact with each other, if someone develops an infection either at a workplace or at a gathering, trans, transmission to household contacts is, is, still, uh, is still common. And that speaks to the, the risk of people transmitting virus early in the course before they have symptoms, before that they, know, before that they, um, they have been, been tested. Um, and, and we still are um, actively monitoring a number of outbreaks in, in workplaces as well. We've done relatively well with long-term care facilities. We still have, I think, about 60 active investigations, which means there's cases that we're, we're, trying, to, uh, we're trying to stop transmission and, and investigate. Um, but those numbers have been small, limited to one or two, one or two uh, patients or residents. So there is, it is a wide, a wide range, um, and the, it's difficult to have a precise estimate just because the, um, the, the data are, are imperfect, and it's, uh, it's challenging to get all the data in a timely fashion. A lot of our public health departments are making, you know, have making many, many calls, um, have a, a, t tend to have a backlog of investigations that they need to do, so we're focusing on the, you know, the, the most critical essential information, which is are you able to become isolated and who are the individuals you've been in contact with to support them. Um, so they're doing the best they can, but there's, um, you know, there's, there's going to be some imprecise thing about the, about, uh, uh, about the overall proportions. All right, uh, our next question, also Green Bay, Ben Crumholtz, WLUK, Ben. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my question is, has Wisconsin considered a travel advisory list similar to New York, and why or why not? Well, we're on New York's list, so I guess we could, we could, we'd have retribution and say they'd have to do the same. Uh, those travel advisories are almost impossible to uh, uh, to follow. I mean. If, if you're flying into a city, a big city in, in like New York City, you're able to do something around that. But our, our state has so many roads and other ways to, to move in and out of our state that it seems seemingly is impossible to, uh, uh, to enforce. Uh, so I don't anticipate uh, uh, having one of those um, uh, dealing with that issue. Uh, my goal is to get off of New York's issue. Not that I want people to travel to New York, but if they put us on their list and they're, they're thinking that we are having surges here, which we are, and uh, the sooner people uh, work together to make sure that uh, they're wearing a mask and that they're uh, keeping distance, uh, appropriate distance from each other, uh, then we can uh, get off of their list. All right, the next question comes from Mitchell Schmidt, Wisconsin State Journal. Mitch. Yeah, thank you all very much for the call today. Uh, you, you preempted me on the, uh, the uh, New York order. I was just kind of curious uh, if you might be able to talk a little bit about, I mean, do you feel that that's a warranted response from uh, the governor of New York to add Wisconsin to that list, especially in light of 
the increased cases that uh, we were talking about earlier. And then the only other one was uh, just kind of curious, what sort of impact, if any, that may or may not have on, uh, on the state of Wisconsin? Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm guessing not much. I mean, certainly, certainly economically and, and uh, personally, people uh, have ways to interact with uh, folks in New York City and, and the state without actually traveling there. So I'm not sure the, the, that it will have uh, much of an imp impact at all. I just, I just think that we should use this as a, a motivator to continue, continue to do the best we can and actually increase our, um, our ability and our, our participation in having masks and uh, uh, keeping, keeping socially distant and staying home as often as possible. All right, let's go now to Amy Flugsoft from WMTV. Amy, are you there? Hi. Hi, yes. Um, thank you for taking my call. This message is for Governor Evers. Um, I know you talked about uh, not making a statewide mandate for whether opening or keeping schools closed, but with so much uncertainty right now, and we're so close to the start of school, many um, parents are both working and need to be making decisions. Um, what advice do you have to parents right now um, as it stands? What can you tell them to kind of help plan for the fall? Well, absolutely. First of all, they should be in direct contact with their school, school districts who are making that, uh, that decision of how, how to open up. Uh, our, our role in this would be to, uh, if things are completely out of control, to uh, uh, suggest that they not open. I'm not sure that they're uh, there's uh, the ability anymore from the, from the uh, state level to make that decision anyway. But the, um, uh, the bottom line is parents should plan. Your, your school districts are, are saying it right now. They plan to open. I, I see it all across the state. So they, they need to be in contact with uh, their local school districts. Child care is obviously an important thing. Um, I know that back in the days, but... Uh, uh, I, I would be prepared to uh, send your children to school. All right, let's go now to Jeremy Janine from Urban Milwaukee. Jeremy? Last, uh, this question is for the DHS personnel. Last week you said other states with greater outbreaks gave us an opportunity to learn from what was happening. What have you learned in the past week? Uh, so I will also let, uh, or ask Dr. Westgar if you want to add anything, but I do think, right, um, like the spring, uh, ju similar to now, uh, we are seeing um, outbreaks in states uh, around this country uh, that uh, we we certainly don't want uh, to get to that point. And so um, uh, we need to do the things uh, that are necessary to reflatten the curve and to uh, prevent ourselves from getting to the place uh, where our hospital systems and our frontline healthcare workers are, are really unable to meet the demands uh, of, of um, patients that need hospital level care. And so uh, I, I think it's as simple as that. We, we can look um, to folks who are a few weeks ahead of us, uh, recognize uh, that this virus means business, that it uh, um, spreads rapidly, that it continues to be contagious. Uh, and um, and then do the things together that we know we need to do uh, to stop the spread, uh, flatten the curve, and uh, and not get ourselves in a place that is really difficult to manage. But I, I don't know if you have specific scientific lessons. The link between social interaction and particularly close contact, uh, particularly indoors, and disease transmission just gets stronger and stronger. You know, we always presume this would be the case because what we know about respiratory viruses in general, but we're seeing the same story get told is that when people interact more in indoor settings and don't wear face masks and larger numbers of people get together, that drives transmission. So we haven't learned this. It wasn't something that we is surprising or that we didn't know to be true before, but the evidence continues to get stronger. And the more we see it, the, the, with the more certainty we can make these recommendations that this is the, these are the things that we need to do. We need to wear masks when we're indoors. We need to limit close contact. It's going to make, and, and frankly, those are our, our only tools right now. So the story is getting stronger and the evidence is getting stronger. And we're, we're learning that uh, those lessons over every day. 
All right, our next question comes from Hillary Mintz at WISN. Hillary? Yeah, Governor, getting back to the New York travel advisory, um, it's, I know you said it seems like it's impossible to enforce here in Wisconsin. Uh, it seems also that it's more about sending a statement. So why is that something that Wisconsin is not interested in doing as far as other states? And what does Wisconsin have to do to get off of New York's hotspot? Well, we have to, we have to uh, uh, mitigate the uh, the virus in the state of Wisconsin. It's important that uh, we do all the things we've all said probably 15 times today and do it well. And uh, then we will be in a better position. Our positivity rates will be down or the numbers will be down. And frankly, the, uh, the hospitalizations will be down. And then we can probably get off of, uh, of Governor Cuomo's list. But yeah, sending a message. So we send a message, and uh, just how how is that enforced? It it, it uh, you know I guess I, I can honestly say that I never realized that that was a, a significantly um, important tool in a toolbox. And uh, uh, if I need to rethink that, I will. But uh, you know we have how many roads cross in between here, Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois. And do we set up um, stoppages at every, at every road and take temperatures and maybe do, do a quick test to make sure that uh, people are okay to come in? There reaches, reaches a point where that has, frankly, no practical value and, frankly, no messaging value. All right. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the next question, Steve Prestigard, The Platteville Journal. Steve? Thanks for taking my uh, call. Um, our newspaper has been covering over the last couple of weeks how schools are dealing with, uh, um, you know, the decision of having classes in person in September or not. Um, and one of the issues that school superintendents have come up with that, it, that are concerned about is um, that whether or not they're going to get the state aid that they would typically expect to get. Um, this fall, there's the third Friday count in September, of course, and I think there's uh, more um, aid perhaps that, come, that comes up before school districts figure out their budgets. They're also concerned about kind of expenses they can't really anticipate in areas like staffing if they need smaller classes and uh, tech and that sort of thing. Uh, is there anything that the that you support, Governor, as far as uh, either a temporary or not so temporary increase to um, to school districts in the aid that would come from the state to help those sorts of issues? Well, cer certainly the uh, amount of state aid going to school districts uh, in the budget for next uh, next fiscal or the next fiscal year is an increase, a uh, pretty significant increase in a, in, a, in a number of areas. So it's our plan to do whatever we can as we look at uh, cutting our budget to uh, minimize and maybe hold harmless uh, money that leaves the state and goes into the municipalities and school districts and so on. That's always been our goal and will continue to be, to be our goal. Um, to, to go above any increase of that, I would say there's, there's very little chance because uh, our revenue sources are uh, drying up just like everybody else's. But we're, we're, what we're doing is making cuts to um, state government to make to do whatever we can to minimize the uh, threat to uh, state aid to school districts. The other thing uh, that's hopeful is I, I was with, uh, not with, but on a, meet, on a, um, a call with um, Vice President Pence yesterday, and he was talking about the next round of uh, money coming from Washington, D.C. would likely have uh, money for schools to, um, to deal with the issues that they need to deal with uh, as they get ready for the next school year. All right. And our next question from Victor Jacobo from CBS 58. Victor? 
Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you again for taking the call. And uh, my question is about uh, CARES Act funding and kind of building off uh, Governor what you just said about your conversation with Vice President uh, Pence. I was wondering, um, you know, what's the status currently of, of this current uh, round of CARES Act funding? Uh, where you see the remaining um, funds going? And what's the conversation with the Wisconsin congressional delegation in Washington? Uh, as next week they return from the recess, and obviously that conversation is, is going to be happening. So I'm wondering uh, what uh, the priorities are uh, that uh, you're having with the congressional delegation uh, to, to help the states for, for uh, what may be the next round of, of funding. Thank you. Yeah, and we and we are uh, the, the National Governors Association that I belong to, as well as other organizations, plus our own work uh, with uh, the congressional. A delegation is to the next round of uh, CARES funding to have money to assist local municipalities and state governments in, um, uh, in remaining somewhat whole uh, during this uh, uh, time of difficult revenue. Um, and so that, that is there and certainly we would support the, uh, the additional money for uh, school districts also. So those are those are the areas that we're working on and uh, uh, hopefully we'll have some success in that area. All right, and we um, have gone through our list, but we did have two reporters not available. So let's try to call one more time on Bruce from WRJO. Bruce from WRJO. Okay, what about Savannah from Spectrum News? Savannah from Spectrum News. All right, well with that, let's conclude today's briefing. We want you to all please to continue to monitor the DHS COVID-19 web pages for data and for guidance. Additional information can be found on the websites of the Governor, the Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Public Instruction, and the Department of Children and Families and Wisconsin Emergency Management. Be safe and have a great afternoon. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 